Hi guys, welcome to the show. Um, I am doing it solo this week because our fearless historian, Laura, uh, is on vacation. So I am going to be bringing you the history and the hauntings all by myself. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, before I do start, I do want to say that... Um, I also did the history research on the show um, by myself, and I have to say that it is a lot harder than um, Laura makes it seem. She <laughs> Every week she always brings a really thorough and interesting deep dive into the history of the locations that we cover. So doing her part of the research was really hard. So um, I, I wasn't giving her enough credit when I was like, all right, no problem. I'll research the, the history. How hard could it be? Famous last words. So um, Hopefully I, I do uh, the history of this really amazing location justice and I'd hopefully I do her justice by stepping into her um, really big shoes to fill because it, it wasn't easy to um, pour through the, the rich history of this location and put together a really um, interesting and cohesive story. So hopefully, Laura, I don't fuck it up. Um, and if I do, then maybe you'll just come back sooner. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, guys, um, let's go over a few EVPs real quick. Um, Endless Vocal Prattling is the name of this segment. And Essentially, we just want to remind you guys, we are going to be at the Mansfield Paris uh in May, the third weekend in May, and that's going to be held at the um, Mansfield Reformatory, Ohio State Reformatory, the famous, famous super haunted prison um, that the Shawshank Redemption was filmed at. Most of you guys know it as that. So we're going to be there all weekend. We're going to have a vendor booth. It's going to be really, really great. You can um, check out their website at um, parasicon.com. And I believe that's the website. I hope I didn't mess that up. Anywho. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's the one thing we want to remind you guys. The second thing is that we are bringing back our, our merch presale that's actually going to be running from Monday, January 16th through the end of February. We've got uh, OG hoodies, we've got zip up hoodies, sweatpants, t shirts, tank tops, the whole bit, um, a bunch of different colors to choose from. So um, we're going to be running the pre sale again. We had a lot of interest in it last time. We had people ask us to bring it back. So we're bringing it back. Um, we're really excited about that. Like I said, it's going to start running uh, Monday, which if you're listening to it to, to this episode today, that's tomorrow, Monday, January 16th through the end of February. Once we get all of the orders in, we'll get them to our vendor and um, their turnaround time is about two weeks. As soon as we get them back, then we will ship them out to you guys. So... Um, yeah, I believe that's it. Usually Laura reminds me of something or I remember something later on down the line. That's probably going to happen again today. So to that end, guys, let's talk about where we are taking you today. It's a really fantastic location. So we're going to be taking you guys to Spike Island in Ireland. And this location is known to be or described to be the um, island's Alcatraz. Uh, so I'm really excited about this one. And um, my sources for both the history and the hauntings for today's episode are archaeology.org, spikeislandcork.ie, spiritedisle.ie, Cork, B -O -B -E -O .ie, John Crotty Author .com, and as always, 
Destination Fear. Now, the crew went to um, the Destination Fear crew went to Spike Island. It was the um, final episode of season three, and they had a wild time. That's actually where I got the idea to cover this location. So let's get right into the history, shall we? Man, am I nervous. I have never had to do this show on my own. And so I'm hella freaking nervous. So we also do have photo credits um, of the photos that we're going to show and share on our social media. They go to Louise Bunyan, Shay Wolf, and John Crotty Author.com. So here we go. <sighs> All right, everybody, let's hold hands and we'll white knuckle it through this. <laughs> In the last 1300 years, Spike Island has been host to a 7th century monastery, a 24 acre fortress, the largest convict depot in the world during Victorian times, and centuries of island homes. Families lived on this island. Um, the island's rich history has included monks and monasteries, rioters and redcoats, captains and convicts, sinners and saints. So let's take a little look at this amazing sounding location. <laughs> so this is um, Spike Island. You can only access it um, from the mainland via a ferry. And it is a lot bigger than it looks here in this picture. Um, so it was used as an island prison on four different occasions over the course of 400 years. The first one being in um, the 1600s, which held um, Cromwellian prisoners during the tenure of Oliver Cromwell in Britain. So it is um, uh, the second time it was a prison rather was in the 1840s and it became the largest prison in the world there has never been a larger prison in britain or ireland before or since so then the third opened in 1921 and it held over 1200 irish republican prisoners during the irish war of independence now, the final prison opened in as recently as 1985 and shockingly stayed open until 2004. That's how long this um, island and how long Spike Island was a prison and its four different incarnations of being a prison. So it goes back even further than that, though. So a monastery was built on the island in 635 A.D., after its founder, St. Mochita, also known as uh, St. Carthage, cured the High King of Ireland and was granted land, um, including Innis Pick. I am butchering these Irish names and words. I'm so sorry. Including Innis Pick for the, forevermore. Uh, so he set up a monastic outpost and spent one year on the island before departing it. He left 40 followers behind to carry on his work, and he founded another famous monastery in Lismore, Count Waterford. The disciples left behind on Spike Island carried on his work with distinction and with later descriptions stating that, quote, that island is most is a most holy place in which an exceedingly devout community constantly dwell. So it had been a safe haven um, with ample safety and sustenance for the monks who farmed the land and fished in the waters. So that was until, I keep saying so a lot, that was until the Vikings came um, and they stormed into Cork Harbor in 820 AD. Um, and at the very least, this likely meant a temporary abandonment of the site. There are reports of, um, a, of a monastic community in operation as late as the 16th century, suggesting that varying degrees of occupancy um, were happening on the island across an amazing span of 900 years. So... The Cromwellian Inquest of Ireland, which went from 1649 to 1653, was the conquest of Ireland by the forces of the English Parliament led by Oliver Cromwell during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Now, Cromwell had invaded Ireland in August of 1649 in a very brutal, very bloody campaign that is often um, maligned and looked down on to this day. So by May of 1652, 
Cromwell's parliamentarian army had defeated Confederate and Royalist, the Confederate and Royalist coalition in Ireland and occupied the country. It effectively ended the Irish Confederate Wars, or also known as the Eleven Years' War. So while many were killed during that, uh, tens of thousands of prisoners were taken, and um, those were mainly the people that um, a were accused of aiding the rebellion. So the punishment for many years was transportation or what, and when I say transportation, and I'm going to mention it often, transportation was essentially the banishment to a foreign colony to work a term of indentured servitude. So it became a situation of where to hold the approximately 50,000 men who would be sent to the North American colonies, the Caribbean islands like Jamaica and Barbados. So it appears that Spike Island was the solution. And for the first time in its history, this is when the island became its first incarnation of a prison. So the first fortification was actually built on Spike Island in 1779, while the American War of Independence was raging on. And the Kingdom of Great Britain was on high alert because of that. Now, over the centuries, many superpowers had attempted to invade England and the Kingdom of Ireland. Um, It was seen as a backdoor for invasion. So um, the great ships of the age and the global outlook of these modern superpowers made Cork Harbor a very important asset with its ability to shelter entire fleets within its confines. This asset had to be protected, and it had to be protected um, with no less than uh, three forts that would eventually guard the mouth of the vital Cork Harbor. So the 24-acre star-shaped fort, Fort Mitchell, Um, It was started in 1804, and it is one of the largest of its type in the world, and it was the cutting edge of military technology when it was completed around 1850. So the the designers chose the distinctive star-shaped design, which had replaced the old straight-walled design of Norman castles. Um, They were big and impressive, but they were kind of an easy target for um, the ever-improving cannon fire that was being developed. So let's take another look at the picture of Spike Island. Let's see here. Okay. So you, it's diff- a little bit difficult to see the actual star shape, but you can make it out pretty good in this photograph. The points of the star shape meant that defenders had overlapping arcs of fire over all parts of the island, essentially making the entire island one effective kill zone. So should an enemy survive the run-up, um, the run up of the steep man made hill um, and get close enough to the fort, flanking galleries were built into the sides of the bastions, providing firing positions for defensive troops to fire on enemy troops. So, if you take a look, like the angles of the points of the star, there really was no one way that it, it could be. S- you couldn't sneak up on it. Like it was no matter which direction you came from you were going to get attacked by trying to get close to this fort. So um, the flanking galleries were infantry firing positions set into the fort walls with narrow firing ports, which enabled the defenders to fire on approaching enemy troops from relative safety. Now, The whole entire fort itself was built with a low profile, setting it down into the island's summit in such a way that it can barely be seen by approaching enemy troops. So this made it exceptionally difficult to target the fort with cannon fire from ships in the harbor or small arms on the ground. Now, the British engineers had to shave over 25 feet off the top of the off the top of the island to create this. So um, well over a million pounds was spent on the structure, which would be between 500 million and a billion pounds in today's money. So this puts the structure on par with modern super stadiums. While the roof at Wembley Stadium covers 11 acres, the fort on Spike Island expands to an impressive 24 acres, just shy of the 28 acres of the American Pentagon. 
So the vital strategic importance of Spike Island was being recognized in a fitting way, and it would be for the next 250 years. Winston Churchill actually declared in 1938 that the island and similar defenses at Bearhaven and Lofswilly were, quote, the sentinel towers of the approaches to Western Europe. Well, by 1820, the main work of the halls, or I'm sorry, the main work of the walls, the bastions, and some accommodation blocks were complete uh, before the funds dried up for military building entirely, not just on this fort, but just kind of overall. But by this time, the imp impressive fortress had emerged to defend Cork Harbor. So on its completion, the fort was capable of garrisoning up to 3,000 men, but as a result of the famine years in Ireland, it also had to hold prisoners from 1847 to 1883 in addition to its military garrison. Now, after 1883, it returned to British military use. When Ireland gained independence in 1922, Britain insisted on retaining the vital port or the vital fort as part of the peace treaty. So it was in 1938 before the island and the fort were given back to Ireland as part of negotiations around a trade war. Um, the fort was renamed from Fort Westmoreland to Fort Mitchell. Um, that was following the Irish independence, and it was named after the Irish nationalist John Mitchell, who was a prisoner on Spike Island in 1848. Now, in the mid-19th century, Ireland was in the midst of a crisis. The repeated failure of the potato crop had driven millions of people to the brink of starvation. This catastrophe that was combined with simmering social, religious, and political tensions associated with British rule in Ireland forced thousands of people to flee the country every month. Many of them left from the small town of Cove in Cork Harbor. Now, during the 19th and early 20th centuries, as many as 2.5 million Irish men, women, and children departed from Cove alone, more than from any other port in Ireland. A lot of tearful families gathered on the waterfront to say their goodbyes because many were seeing their loved ones and their homeland for the last time. So as they sailed out through Cork Harbor, they would pass this foreboding island on their right, featuring a bleak stone fortress that must have been a little bit of a jarring contrast to the colorful rows of Victorian architecture that lined the streets of their home, their town they just left behind, right? Now, the island was known all over Ireland, and everyone who sailed past it must have been a little unnerved by the, the sheer look of it. It was Spike Island, and it was going to become the site of Ireland's most notorious prison. So, Cork Harbor is located along Ireland's southern coast, and it's always bustling with activity. There's pleasure lot, yeah, lots, Nope. Aaron, write that down. There are pleasure yachts, cruise ships, tour boats, even Irish naval vessels that um, all crisscross its water. It's a very busy harbor. At its northern end lies the mouth of the River Lee and further inland Cork, the Republic of Ireland's second largest city. So in the early 20th century, the harbor scenic town of Cove gained some notoriety for its link to two famous maritime disasters. It was the last port of call for the Titanic in 1912, and three years later, Lusitania was torpedoed just off its shores. Memorials to both tragedies stand close to its waterfront, so it, it, it would be an amazing place to go and visit. Today, Cove is best known, or... Yeah, it's best known as the place that you have to catch the fury. The fury? Aaron, write it all down. I am, I'm, I'm so nervous about doing Laura's part. <laughs> it's the best place to catch the ferry to Spike Island, which is now one of Ireland's most popular tourist attractions. In fact, it um, was recently named the most popular European tourist destination over, um, I believe it was the Colosseum in Rome, Buckingham Palace, and um, the Louvre. Like some, it won the best tourist destination over all of those 
iconic, more well-known destinations. So Spike Island was described by the prisoners who were there as hell on earth. Early on, it was a place synonymous with death. More than 1,000 prisoners perished in its first seven years of operation. Damn. The British, who controlled Ireland until 1921, conceived of the prison as a solution to what authorities saw as the increasing criminality of the Irish people. So what Spike Island did house um, was hardened criminals and political prisoners, um, most famously the Irish nationalist John Mitchell, who, like I said, the fort would later become named for this man. Um, many confined there were petty thieves who had fallen on hard times. Some committed small crimes just to make ends meet. And in the 1840s, even minor offenses could get you sent to Spike Island. As the years went on, some inmates were sent to Australia. Some were returned to their homes in Ireland, but many never made it off the island. So... In 2013, University College Cork began a project that included not only excavations at various sites across the island, but they also did a deep dive into government archives, first-hand accounts of prisoners, officials, and guards, and other historical sources. Along the way, they had uncovered evidence of Spike Island's operational deficiencies, deplorable living conditions, and institutional racism. They have also revealed the respectful behavior some prisoners exhibited to, toward their fellow inmates upon their deaths. So, beginning in the late 18th century, the British constructed a series of fortifications strategically located on Spike Island. Um, now, it would only be fully, um, it was only partially completed when the work was halted in 1820, like I mentioned, and it wouldn't be fully completed until decades later, built by the very inmates incarcerated behind its walls. And that's a very common thing. We see that a lot here in the United States with some of our older prisons. Yuma Territorial Prison is famous for having been built by the prisoners that were going to be housed there. Um, there's a number of, uh, I believe, uh, Trans Allegheny. Um, which is, which, or which was a mental asylum, was built by prison labor. So that's a very common um, thing to have, hab have had happen back then. Now, around this time, the British penal system was beginning to evolve. And prior to the 19th century, lawbreakers were inca incarcerated for brief periods of time in small local holding cells, the concept of larger permanent prisons was unknown in the British Isles, but that was soon going to change. So, I need to quit saying so. I'll replace it with um. <laughs> Ireland had no purpose built prisons in 1800, but by 1830, every single county had a jail and all the big, the big towns had a city, city jail. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this research... Um, was being head up by a bioarchaeologist, Bera O'Donabain. Now, I'm going to say that person's name often coming up, and I apologize if I am utterly butchering the pronunciation, but O'Donabain is what we're going to call them. Now, he believes that the events of the French Revolution, um, which unsettled the British upper class, um, may have had direct impact on this movement. Quote, it's the fear of the poor, the fear of revolution that does this, he says. It's like they said, we have to make sure this doesn't happen here. How do we do that? We lock them up. It's not a great, it's not a great start. It's really kind of not a great end. But another way the British prevented popular unrest was to simply dispose of the poor and criminal classes by shipping them out of the country. Um... In the 18th and 19th centuries, one of the fundamental tenets of the British penal system was transportation, which I had mentioned in the beginning of the episode. Under this system, people convicted of felony offenses were involuntarily exiled to distant colonies across the British Empire. It was common for an Irishman or an Irish woman to be sentenced to seven years transportation to Australia, where... <clears throat> they were deported from Ireland and pressed into penal servitude. When they had completed their sentence, they were freed, but they were not allowed to return home, which I find 
utterly shocking. Um, <laughs> hang on with me, guys, for just one second. Okay, so Spike Island played a major role in the British penal system in Ireland, but it was only supposed to be a temporary solution to an ever-developing crisis. By the mid-19th century, the British government was running out of places to send Irish convicts. Since the 1780s, they had been sent to Australia, but colonial authorities there were growing wary of the practice and they began to resist it. Because it took longer and longer to find suitable places to send Irish criminals, Irish jails became exceedingly crowded and increasingly dangerous. Another factor contributing to the overcrowding was the Great Famine. And that lasted um, in Ireland from 1845 to 1852. This catastrophe caused the deaths of up to one million people, but millions of others were driven to wander the countryside in search of food. Many of them resorted to crime in, other, in order to survive, stealing food, animals, and small items to trade or even maybe sell. Those who were found guilty of this were found, um, the charge was felony grand larceny, and they were commonly sentenced to transportation. But many British statutes had not been updated in centuries, and the definition of felony grand larceny had not changed since the 13th century. It was still defined as the theft of any property valued over one shilling, even after centuries of inflation. So... It's, it's it's equal to stealing like one of those little like five cent Brock's candies at the grocery store that you used to see. And then you are shipped away to Australia for essentially forced labor. Insanity. So this um, <laughs> not only had it become more difficult to ship Irish criminals away, but the number of them was also growing exponentially. So to alleviate the stress of affecting the jails, the British government looked to the island in the middle of Cork Harbor. So the island's size, its location, and its fort infrastructure convinced the government officials that it would make a really great place where criminals could be temporarily or held temporarily as transport ships were prepared. However, by 1853, transportation of small-time offenders was abolished, and most Irish convicts began serving their sentences at home. This meant that Spike Island uh, ended up housing prisoners longer than was originally planned. Now, O'Donabane's uh, research and excavations have shown that it was drastically unsuitable for this venture. Spike Island was never intended to hold more than a few hundred convicts for a short amount of time, but it remained open as a prison for 36 years and at its height had a population of around 2,500 inmates. Isn't that a common theme? Isn't that a common theme, guys? Like, we hear this all the time. Uh, overcrowding in prisons, overcrowding in asylums. Like, there are just not, there were just not enough spaces to house everything everyone that needed to be housed in one or more of these type of institutions. So one of the major, here I go with so again, one of the major challenges at first was that there was simply not enough room for the number of comics being sent there. O'Donabane says, quote, they immediately just jammed the place full of people. So the fort's former military barracks were transformed into convict housing. Each room, which measured measured 48 feet long by 18 feet wide, had originally been intended to house around 13 British soldiers when it was a fort. Yet as many as 50 Irish prisoners were assigned to each of these quarters, which was almost four times the capacity. Now, excavations were revealed why convicts frequently complained about Spike Island's notoriously bad drinking water. Why, while this... Um, this research group was being led by O'Donabane. While digging beneath the outdoor prison yard, they uncovered pipes from Spike Island's overtaxed and inadequate sewer and freshwater systems. What they discovered was that there were two occasionally, the two were, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the sewer and the freshwater systems were occasionally one in the same. 
They said, quote, we found that they were harvesting rainwater from the roofs of all buildings and funneling it into a tank underneath the yard. Fresh water is going one way, sewer pipes are going another, and they would have gotten mixed quite regularly. They, they go on to say conditions were grim. That, I don't even think, I think that is far, far above grim. <laughs> so despite these conditions, the men were occasionally able to break the monotony, monotony of prison life. During these excavations, dozens of small objects were found hidden beneath cell floorboards, stowed there safely out of the sight of the prison guards. They were carved pieces of bone and stone. I don't want to know where the bone came from. Um, and some of them were made into gaming pieces, such as dominoes, while others were just small objects of prisoner art. These objects represent small acts of resistance to prisoners' highly regimented lives. Fair, fair. So, while no women were sent to Spike Island, children as young as 13 were held there, 200 of which were housed in a windowless bunker-like building that had once been used um, to store the fort's gunpowder. Prison records um, did indicate that most of the youths were sentenced to Spike Island for stealing items as trivial as umbrellas, handkerchiefs, or shoes. Some of them were sent there simply because they were homeless, and at the time, vagrancy had been criminalized. According to O'Donabane, the criminal justice system of the time was purposely stacked against the young. And this is really foul, you guys. Essentially, he said, quote, they were harvesting these kids for the colonies. They were looking for young, fit men and women. They were not going to bother with transporting a 50-year-old. It's a waste of time and money. But teenagers, they were prime for the picking. I, I don't love, I, I don't love any of it. So life on Spike Island was hard and convicts were forced to work long hours on various government building projects um, to help ensure the men's best behavior. Each inmate's conduct was recorded on a badge that they were forced to wear on their sleeve. Prisoners who misbehaved were, of course, treated harshly. Um, originally, there was a series of 11 punishment cells. These were actually old soldiers latrines resembling outhouses that were converted into isolation booths. So after a prison guard was murdered in 1856, a new punishment block was constructed. Its cells were dark, cold, and known to drive some men to insanity. It's all about sensory deprivation. You're literally in the dark. So Spike, I, this so, guys, I'm so sorry. Oh, I did it again. Okay, here we go. Spike Island's harsh conditions, the poor medical care, the overcrowding, led to an almost astronomical death rate, especially in the years during the famine and when the prison first opened. So the... So, the, <laughs> the first prison ship docked at the island in October 1847, carrying 109 men. By the end of the year, two months later, seven of those men were dead. That trend would get worse before it got better. Around 1,200 men and boys died on Spike Island throughout its three and a half decades as a prison. In its most deadly year, one prisoner was buried almost every single day. The overwhelming majority of deaths occurred in the first seven years. And um, this was at the time when conditions at the prison were at their worst. They weren't trying to kill them. They were just, there were just way too many people there. It was not until penal reforms in the 1850s reduced Spike Island's prisoner population from 2,500 to 900 that the numbers of the dead finally began to, to drop. Now, Spike Island finally shut its doors, or the prison on Spike Island shut its doors, the first go round, I mean, in 1883, at which time the island reverted back to British military control. Overhauls to the British and Irish penal system had improved conditions, but in the end, Spike Island's ill-suited infrastructure and expensive costs of running a prison on an island made it unfeasible, unfeasible to maintain. And I, if I remember correctly, that's sort of the fate that Alcatraz had. It just became too expensive to 
keep housing these prisoners there. Uh, if you think about all of the different ways and means and things that an island needs to run as a prison, and it's about, you know, they're, they're, sometimes they had to have, sh you know, items and goods shipped there. Obviously, it's an island. There was no easy way. Um, and all of that was probably at significant cost for Alcatraz and, and Spike Island. It makes a lot of sense. In 1985, after a 102-year hiatus, Irish authorities returned the island to its roots by once again installing a prison there. Maybe they thought they had a better business plan in 1985. I don't know. So in August 1985, the prisoners had returned to their cells for the night and everything was calm. But an argument had quickly escalated and suddenly the prisoners were escaping from their dorm rooms or their cells. This article is called them dorm rooms in numbers. A major riot was underway, and the prison was actually never going to be the same again. The prison officials had to flee the fortress for their safety, as the prisoners had broken into the maintenance, um, the maintenance rooms and armed themselves with makeshift weapons. The prison officers managed to make it to a boat, but the island residents had a scary situation when they found the prisoners uh, were standing in between them and the island's pier. So they negotiated safe pas passage with the prisoners and they waited in a hut for a boat to take them to safety. The prisoners now had full control of the island um, and they had broken out of the fort. So, you know, they had the full control of the island, but the nature of the island um, prison was proving effective, Very again, very similar to Alcatraz, and they did not attempt to swim the cold and dangerous waters in Cork Harbor. So what they did was they broke back into the fort, hot wearing a JCB digger. I don't know what that is. I'm assuming it's a piece of earth moving equipment. If you guys know, let me know. Um, they hot wired this JCB, JCB digger and they blocked up the entrance to the prison. They set buildings, buildings on fire, including their own cell block and the records room. So Irish police were dispatched from Cove in a boat but were met with overwhelming opposition and were forced to lie low. These prisoners took control over the whole joint. So one of the detectives, Jark, Jark, nope, Jack Hartnett, Aaron, write that down. Detective Jack Hartnett, um, he frantically phoned for reinforcements. And in this article, he says, quote, it was bedlam. The first guards who went out couldn't do, couldn't do anything. The prisoners were all over the island and the situation was potentially very serious. They had set fire to buildings and armed themselves. And with over a hundred prisoners, this was a deadly scenario. Now, the riot continued for hours before the prisoners climbed on top of the fort's Mitchell Hall, where they remained for most of the next day. This allowed the prison officers to return with reinforcements. The army also arrived on the island with an armed unit, but they were wisely turned away as the, situa the situation was de-escalating and it didn't need further provocation and the presence of the military would certainly derail all of that. <laughs> By the end of the next afternoon, the prisoners surrendered and the riot was over. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured, but the beautiful A Block, which had stood since 1820, was burned out, as was the west side of B Block. Now, there was a lot of finger pointing after the riot, and it was generally agreed um, that the accommodation in the converted fortress was unsuited for prisoners. There were no cells and inmates were accommodated in the dormitories, which had been used for naval service personnel only. The riot led to the construction of a formal four man prison cells in the C block, the new C block, which remained in use until 2004. And you can actually see that that cell block today. So today, when you go to visit the fort, uh, visitors, um, you can see the impressive walls, um, entrance walls to the enormous um, parade ground that's inside. Many of the original buildings and tunnels can be explored as um, part of your visit to Spike Island. The fort is so large. This is my favorite part. I love good fun facts. So the fort is so large, it could fit the Colosseum of Rome inside its walls four times over. 
and modern sports stadiums and the whole of Alcatraz could fit inside. The fort. It's absolutely gigantic. So with all of this chaos, with all of this history, with all of, we've got the monastery, we've got the the military fort, we have, um, you know, all of the, the convicts and the criminals and the famine and the transportation and families having to flee their homes. There's a lot of highly charged energy in this location, which has led to it being one of the most haunted locations in Ireland. It is little wonder that many did try to escape to the island that they refer to as hell by either attempting to um, get off the island or take their own life. Um, So it does beg the question if any of those souls actually left the island. Now, there is a record of a British soldier firing at a phantom ghost, a figure in military uniform that's actually been reported several times. It's earned the nickname the Gaunt Gunner. So if you ask the locals who this could be, they will point to one of several suicides by British service personnel between the late 1800s and the early 20th century. So while suicide is a tragedy pervading all walks of life, the island seems to actually have more than its fair share. Um, the residents who have lived on the island, because remember, you know, like families of the soldiers, they act, there was a, a community that lived on the island for a time. And those residents, they claim to have seen things that they cannot explain. Um, again, going back to the time when the British occupied the island, the story that I mentioned before of the gaunt gunner, the ghostly figure of a British soldier, was cited on at least three separate occasions across the decades. So, a little, oh, hello, the dogs are saying hi. Okay. Um, Prisoners were held in every available building, like I mentioned, in some truly horrific conditions. We talked a little bit about the fresh water and the sewer water. Um, (laughs) They added new buildings like an iron prison and a timber prison. In 1858, work started on the punishment block, which was a horrific space of 28 dark and cold solitary cells. Inmates were kept chained to the wall by their neck and their hands, and they had to wear a black frieze, free, uh, F-R-I-E-Z, sorry, free, frieze, we'll call it a frieze, and had to wear a black frieze outfit covering them head to toe, including a hood um, that hid their faces, and it only had little slits for eyes. So... Before this, the solitary cells were at the back of a series of cavernous tunnels deep underground beneath the fort's walls where there was no light that could shine through. Um, The prison earned the title Ireland's Hell in the mid-19th century, and it was cursed by all who heard its name in Ireland. So multiple hauntings are said to afflict it, including the gruesome specter of a man with black holes for eyes, who terrified so many people over the years. There are a number of reports of this really horrible looking apparition that had black holes for eyes. Soldiers have even shot at the ominous figure, um, obviously to no avail. Others uh, have encountered a white mist, which is attributed to um, former prisoner John Mitchell. And he was the guy who the fort was named after. He was the... um, uh, the Irish uh, Republican nationalist who the fort was named after that I had mentioned a minute ago. Now, again, this man in uniform has been spotted near the fireplace. Uh, reports of a lady in white seen roaming the grounds. In the 1980s, naval cadets stationed here reported disturbances um, while prisoners in the jail reported to guard, complained to guards of a black entity that visited their, cell, their cells during the night. There's photographic evidence captured in 2016 appears to support the, the um, claims of the prisoners. So as you enter the fort, um, the remains of the former soldiers barracks is the first thing that you see. The building was burned down in the 80s and 90s during the riots, but and now it can't be accessed by people. Um, the solitary confinement unit um, obviously was used to imprison Irish IRA soldiers. 
The building had no window, no lighting, no heating. Prisoners were left in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day. Many of the prisoners were driven mad by this, and some committed suicide within the prison cells, and a lot of the tour guides believe that it's their souls that are haunting the building today. So um, there, you can also... Uh, see the abandoned prison cells. This exhibit is only open to the public during the after dark tours. It remains closed during the day. So an Irish paranormal, the Irish paranormal investigations team detected supernatural activity in the building, many of them capturing at least a dark hooded figure in the distance. Now, cell number nine is apparently has always been haunted, even when it was serving as a prison. Convicts refused to stay in that particular jail cell because they were user they were either woken up um, by something or flung from their bed when nobody else was in the cell with them. So a tour guide that had been on the island working for them for about four years said the spookiest incident she had was when she was working in the storeroom and someone had started stroking her hair. She looked around, didn't see anyone. She continued doing her work and it happened again. Now, Louise Bunyan um, is one of the the, um, folks that I gave photo credit to in the beginning of the episode. And she is the one behind this really crazy picture that she took on um, a Sunday in October in the abandoned jail section of the prison. Um, that block held prisoners in the 1840s, 1920s, and 1990s. So she was doing the after hours, the after dark tour, and she went to snap an image of the empty cell block. And she was surprised to see that her camera's facial recognition feature activated. So when she brightened the image further, it reveals the distinguishable shape of a man seemingly carrying something across the hall. Um, so (laughs) Spike Island said that their after dark tours focus on the real history of the inmates who inhabited the prison, but visitor sightings are not uncommon. So let's take a look at Louise's photographs. Let's see if I can get this brought up here. So this is the original, this is the initial photograph that she took. And you can clearly see a human figure down there at the end. It's got like the, um, the article said that at this point, the abandoned cell, this area she's looking at, was being lit by candlelight. So you can clearly see there is the a human shape um, that does look like it is carrying something. There looks to be a, a larger object in front of it, object in front of it. Um, but let's take a look at the enhanced photograph. And we're going to put all this on our social media, guys. That is the enhanced. It's lightened. She's zoomed in a little bit. It really, like, you can almost make out eyes and a mouth, maybe even some hair and an ear. You can very see, clearly see there's a leg there. I, it's it's absolutely wild. It almost seems like it has materialized from the darkness behind it. It's really quite something. It's really, really quite something to to look at. Um, As far as spirit photography goes, and she wasn't even trying to capture anything. This is pretty, pretty fucking impressive. Um, So um, again, in the same um, A, B um, cell block area known as the abandoned jail, The following image was snapped in 2019. There is clearly something in the image, but the height and shape is inexplicable. So the roof in the building is not particularly low, but it would have to mean that this object, this of the picture I'm going to show you next, would have to be close to over eight feet tall to fill the frame of the camera and the hallway like this. So here's the first shot. Okay. You can kind of see that there is what appears to be a human shaped shadow in the far back of the cell block. Now, here is the photograph enhanced, lightened up. Take a look at that. Like, 
that is exceptionally tall. It didn't, the article didn't really state exactly how tall the height of the, the ceiling is, but I've been in prisons before and jails before the, the ceiling isn't, isn't low. Like this one, this article said this one wasn't, but that is an a exceptionally tall individual. It's entirely possible that maybe, I don't know about eight feet, but again, without knowing the actual ceiling height, it's hard to, it's hard to guess how tall the shadow figure might be, but it's pretty crazy. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this one. This one I think is really, really cool. Um, now other photographs that have been taken in the prison, um, since it reopened as a visitor attraction, um, seem to show inexplicable shapes, unusual fogs, mists, other unusual phenomena, but on an Island where there are 1300 that are buried in mass graves, victim that were victims of an overcrowded famine era prison. Um, it's not really surprising. The um, research that was taken by the group that I had mentioned in the beginning, um, the Islands Heritage um, team seemed to have uncovered several stories of ghostly reports, including soldiers firing at seemingly, seemingly phantom intruders. Now, the Irish naval cadets who were on the island in the 1980s also reported strange occurrences during their accommodation. Prison guards from the 1980s reported prisoners used to complain of this black entity visiting their cells by night. And this black entity might actually have been captured in this next photograph that I'm going to show you. It was taken by photographer Shea Wolf in an empty cell um, of the abandoned, the abandoned block. So let's take a look at Shay's picture here. Let's see. That's just so wild, you guys. That is just so wild. That's again, that is another really large shadow figure. Um not entirely sure Apparently, when he took this picture, there was nobody standing around him. There was nobody next to him to cast this shadow. Certainly nobody so tall that a shadow this large would have been cast. So there is no explanation that anybody can seem to find um, for this photograph. Uh, it, it looks like to me that it could very well be something paranormal. Um it looks a little bit like it's wearing a hood. If they talk about this hooded figure, um, and remember guys, it was a monastery. So maybe this is the spirit of a former monk that lived on the Island. I don't know. What do you guys think? Crazy, right? Like woof. Okay. So, uh, this one former prison guard said that he was working in the prison during the 18 or the 1890s. No, the 1980s. Okay. Aaron, now I need help with numbers. Um, <laughs> during the 1980s and the 1990s, when a truly troubled individual was incarcerated there, this individual would later be released and go on to commit a horrific trouble or a horrific triple murder of a mother, her child, and a priest. In an event that an event that chilled the prison officer and it shocked the entire nation of Ireland. So while he was incarcerated, the future murderer often complained of being visited by a black entity in his cell. The same claim that numerous prisoners had made over the decades. So the prison officer thought no more of these reports at the time correctly assessing that he was dealing with a very troubled individual. Um, obviously the eventual release and the awful crime the man would commit would seem to suggest that he was not given the care he truly needed. But I do find it really interesting that while he was there, he was complaining about this black entity in his cell, just like so many others throughout the years. So a lot of staff, they don't escape the activity that occurs there either. One Spike Island member was doing a routine cleaning in the block, leaning over with a, um, a dustpan and a brush, sweeping the floor, and she was suddenly pushed over 
tumbling to the floor. She half laughed and was half angry that one of her co-workers would mess around in such a forceful way with her. But when she turned around to confront the colleague, there was no one there. She went to the hall expecting and expecting to see somebody exiting, but nobody was there. She stood alone in the empty old cell block with no explanation for what had shoved her to the ground. Now, Needless to say, she booked it out of there and never went back inside. Staff apparently generally generally enters the block in twos, aware of stories of what has gone before them. So nobody ever goes in there by themselves, which I find utterly fascinating. Um, another member, uh, another staff member recalls walking the long corridor of the block and hearing her name called, but turning around and finding herself alone. One other employee named Eddie recalled the disturbing sight of a ghostly British soldier walking the pier with just a torso and no lower half. Um, However, not one single person that has been there, not one member of staff, anything has ever reported a feeling of anger or danger or bad will against them as far as the ghosts and the paranormal activity on Spike Island. Although I would have to say as a caveat The one um, employee who was shoved to the ground might freaking beg to differ. So um, when Destination Fear went there, um, they had, I think one of the most fascinating encounters that they had was they were investigating. They decided to go take a break and go back to the gear room when Ashley, Ashley, who the hell is Ashley? Um, Chelsea and Alex, good Lord, this is okay. Thanks for hanging in with me, guys. Woof. Um, When Chelsea and Alex stepped outside, just for a break, get a bit of fresh air. But what they heard and what startled and scared them so bad that they ran in and got Dakota and Tanner was they were hearing gunfire coming off the island. And um, they searched around and they couldn't find anything. There are some cannons that I believe are um, just part of the history of of the island um, that are that are there. I don't know if they are original to the fort. I'm not really sure, but they're they're there so that you know obviously it's a fort and so there's cannons there. But they went and checked those out. They did their thermal. They couldn't find anyone on the island, but they kept hearing guns firing coming from the island not from cork across the harbor it was fascinating um i highly recommend if you haven't seen it it's a really great episode uh get a little bit more into um the history some of the hauntings and some of the things that that the group experienced you can watch destination fear on the travel channel or uh, streaming on discovery plus but i do want to say in closing guys and i thank you so much for being here with me and sticking through Laura's part with me. But I want to say um, to close the episode out that it seems that if there are remnants of what went on before on Spike Island, and if such things can occur, then there probably is nowhere more likely that that they would exist on an island with a sense of apathy. Um, that There's no bad feeling that from the spirits for those that come after them. Um, one article said that you can visit it in confidence, but they also said, spare a thought for the 1300 poor souls who never left the Island, who are buried there, some in mass graves. If you do go there interested in the ghosts and the paranormal activity of Spike Island, spare a thought for those 1300 poor souls. So the nighttime tours are for 16 uh, years old and older. They include the horror of the convicts, treatment, murders, and tales from the punishment block, mass graves, and um, you hear a little bit more about the restless souls that reportedly still inhabit the island. Um, I definitely think this is a location that Laura and I should check out. Um, it's it's pretty it's 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 something it's really something so um to that end guys that is our episode i certainly do want to thank you for hanging in there with me laura i hope that i did the history justice um i remember when you did joliet prison uh archie did the history and you had to do my haunting portion and you said how difficult that was and i thought oh it's that's super easy super easy but um 
Yeah, I found that out now by stepping into your shoes and doing your part, which you always do very seamlessly and wonderfully. Um, it is not as easy as you make it look. Uh, so yeah, um, hopefully I did it and you justice. And guys, as always, you can follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and the TikTok. Our handles are uh, at H-O-A-H podcast. For the TikTok, you can also follow us at H-O-A-H carry and at H-O-A-H co-host Laura. So that's it um, for us, guys. We will um, be back with a brand new episode next weekend. And um, I'm going to be doing my weird story. It's just going to be me. I'm solo. Um, I'm going to be recording that right after this. Uh, but I hope you guys are having a wonderful new year. We're about halfway into January. And hopefully 2023 is treating you right, treating you well. And as always, stay safe out there because you never know who or what is listening. That's just not the same without Laura. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>